Wait for everyone to connect and get started. All right. Almost there. Glenn's, Glenn's signing on. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, just get things started as people are signing on and everything. So welcome everyone for coming to our virtual program with Doug Alderson, author of A New Guide to Old Florida Attractions. Doug previously did a program with us on his other book, America's Alligator, which tells the unique past of the Florida alligator and is available for checkout at the library. You can also watch the program by going to our social media or our YouTube channel. It was really great and we're looking forward to having him back. So today, Doug will share the history of Florida attractions accompanied by vintage and contemporary photos of the classic attractions of Florida. Throughout the program, feel free to chat questions and we will answer them at the end. And for anybody tuning in on Facebook, you can also comment on the live stream and we'll answer those as well. So without further ado, let's welcome Doug. Yes, thank you. Great to be back. And um, so this almost follows up a little bit because the attractions uh, include alligator attractions. So it kind of follows up in my other book. Uh, but I love, I love the old Florida attractions. I got the idea. Um, I was paddling with a friend around Silver Springs. We started passing some of the old attractions they used to have. There was an old fort, an old Seminole village, an old pioneer village we started thinking about how many of these places are still open. And we realized that quite a few are still open actually. Some are state parks and some are private. And um, of course, a lot are not open. Uh, I'll cover some of those as well. And there were a lot of fun attractions in the past that we can cover and I, I include those in the books as well. Um, so I'm gonna show some slides uh, because uh, I'm sure you'd rather see photos than just my face here. <laughs> and. Um, and let me start this slideshow. And so this is the first one I've done with the new guide for the second edition. Um, the second edition came out this month. And so you may have seen this old cover here and it came out about five years ago. The new edition is like a marquee cover and it's put out by a Pineapple Press, originally out of Sarasota, now it's out of South Florida. Uh, but it's part of Roman Littlefield, a larger corporation now. Um, but the one of the first tourist guides to Florida really was William Bartram's uh, 1793 guide. He toured the state in 1774 and 1775 era. And um, he wrote about the, the Native Americans, the rivers, the lakes, the alligators, the animals, <clears throat> the plants. <clears throat> and so it was, it was really a fascinating guide. It really piqued the interest of a lot of people into Florida. And many wanted to visit Florida after reading his guide. He often ignored things like uh, mosquitoes and bugs and things like that. So people didn't realize that Florida had many of these things. So he kind of glossed over a few of the hardships. <laughs> so this first edition is at McClay Garden State Park in the, um, in the big old house they have there. Uh, very valuable guide. But some of Florida's first attractions were the mineral springs. These are sulfur springs. Uh, you could smell them usually. They were uh, really not great taste in water, but but they believe they had uh, medicinal qualities. People uh, believe that it was help rheumatism, arthritis, all kinds of ailments. And so uh, large bathhouses were built around these springs. And this is on the Swanee River at White Springs, one of the first attractions started in the, really before the Civil War and went on through the early 1900s. Large motels in the area housed the people People would bottle up the water and take it home with them. And this is White Springs today. The Park Service built, built the structure around the spring, but not the, not the different layers. And some of the old stores and structures are still uh, visible in White Springs. It's a pretty quiet town today compared to what it was uh, in the 1890s and early 1900s. This is on the Suwannee River as well. Suwannee Springs was another uh, small resort. This was a smaller resort, but it was a, a bathhouse built around a spring that flowed into the river. And this photo was taken around 1905 or so. And this metal bridge here is still visible. It's closed, but you can walk on it. 
And this is the, uh, the old bathhouse today. So you can visit this today, it's state land. And you could actually take a swim in the spring if you want to. And the, the window goes out to the main Suwannee River. So there's, there were numerous uh, springs like this and attractions around Florida, especially North Central Florida, where they had most of the springs. <clears throat> so a little bit later, starting in late, um, right after the Civil War, steamships started taking tourists up rivers like the uh, St. John's and the Oklahoma, uh, and that was very popular. People wanted to see the wildlife, they wanted to go see the springs, and this is one of the first glass bottom boats at Silver Springs here in a rowboat. Uh, somebody decided to put a piece of glass in the bottom of a boat and you could see the beautiful springs there. And there was a motel right on the springs at the time. And it was very popular. Most of the tourists then were pretty wealthy. They could afford taking uh, steamships and um, trains down to uh, Jacksonville and St. Augustine and then taking these boats up to Silver Springs. So Florida really hadn't opened up yet quite to the common man from up north to come visit yet because it was, uh, these trips were somewhat expensive at the time. But the trains started opening up uh, and the trains extended all the way down both coast and Henry Flagler went down the east coast and eventually uh, went all the way to Key West. People thought he was crazy, but he actually made it and he bridged the islands and he arrived in Key West in 1912. And then he died soon after that. So this was an incredible accomplishment. Uh, nobody thought he could do it. And it brought a lot of tourists down to uh, the east coast of Florida. Uh, and there was railroads on the west coast as well, bringing people down to uh, St. Petersburg was a very popular destination. And even had cable cars. This is in Jacksonville. And that brought tourists to the Florida ostrich farm, which is no longer in existence. But I have many old postcards from the ostrich farm in Florida. Uh, it's a pretty fascinating place, and they, also, they had alligators as well, and things like that, different animals. But the automobile really opened up Florida to more of the uh, middle class people that could afford traveling in Florida. And this is an old iron bridge in the Swanee River. Um, and it brought people to the beaches, and uh, this old Dixie Highway came down from Michigan to Miami Beach. And it was the brainchild of uh, a man in Miami Beach who wanted to open up Miami Beach to development. And he wanted to bring in people to buy the development. And so he decided to push a highway, which was successful, taking people all the way down. This is the remains of a brick highway in Milton, Florida. So one of the east-west highways was the old Spanish trail, went from San Diego to St. Augustine. And you can still see this five mile stretch of brick highway along Highway 90 uh, near Milton in the Panhandle. It's kind of neat to just visualize taking this brick highway all the way to St. Augustine. <clears throat> so with the automobiles came people who uh, didn't have a lot of money so they would camp out. And Florida was pretty wide open. It was open range. There were really very few fences. And so people camped out all over the place and they could fish and hunt. And, uh, and you can see in this picture, it's a camp and you see pigs running around. So they had livestock. And so they really just uh, stayed for quite several weeks and just kind of lived off the land and brought food and things. And, um, and some of the towns enjoyed having them and some of the towns like St. Petersburg argued about, uh, they wanted to get the higher class tourists. They didn't want kind of like these low class tourists. So they would sometimes ban some of these camps around St. Petersburg. This is St. Petersburg, the Sunshine City, very, very popular in the early 1900s, mostly for the, they tried to style it for the wealthier class. But it, it was soon became a middle class haven as well. So the Seminole Indians, they, they um, the, the game was kind of running low in the Everglades, over hunting. Uh, and so they decided to open up these Seminole villages and they Basically, uh, some non-Indians opened up the alligator wrestling, which I talked about in my last book. And that became very popular in these villages uh, and brought lots of tourists down most of the East Coast, down to Miami and West Palm Beach area. And this seminal wedding here was done several times, the same couple for different tourists. And so people wanted to see traditional ceremonies. And so they redid this wedding ceremony over and over again. <clears throat> St. Augustine was a destination for centuries since the 1600s. 
And Henry Flagler really opened it up and built some posh uh, hotels. And you can see this is part of Flagler College. You can go in and see the ornate roof, which is all gold, built of gold. And inside the cafeteria is the largest collection of Tiffany glass in Florida. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, you can take a tour of this, some of these uh, uh, buildings and some of the glass and the ornate uh, features of them. So they've been a draw, our, our scenery, our wildlife, our fish have been a draw for, for a long time. People thought that the resources were unlimited so that we could fish and hunt with no, uh, you know, no diminishment of the resources. Of course, this isn't true. So eventually conservation laws had to be enacted. But this observation tower in the Everglades, even then the Everglades was popular even 120 years ago and this was built by a women's club uh, in the Everglades near Miami. Of course, mostly in the wintertime, the summer, uh, the mosquitoes can be kind of rough. So the Florida Park Service was established to develop some of the, the featured sites in Florida and historic sites in uh, 1935. And so some of the first parks were really built by the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, workforce during the depression. And so they opened up things like the Florida Cavern State Park and you can still see the chisel marks on the, on the cave walls where they enlarged the openings to the different rooms. So a lot of work it took a couple of years to really open up this cave for the tours to where you don't have to crawl through the, the cave, beautiful cave. And it's open today after Hurricane Michael impacted the park, but the park is reopened. Torreya State Park, a lot of these were in North and Central Florida. Uh, some of the other ones uh, were Alino State Park and Highlands Hammock State Park, some of the first ones. And you can see a museum for the CCC in Highlands Hammock State Park uh, near Sebring. And some of the features in Florida, the really unique features like uh, Payne's Prairie, that became a state, they became state parks as well. This is about a 1905 photo of uh, the sink at Payne's Prairie. So garden attractions, uh, Florida being subtropical and, and South Florida almost tropical, uh, became very popular for gardens, year round gardening. And so they started opening up all throughout Florida. So I could do a whole book just on garden attractions. There's so many. I try to include the oldest garden attractions and people would write and say, what about this or that? And I said, well, it's not quite old enough really because I, like I said, I could do the whole book on just gardens, but there's some beautiful gardens in Florida. And then it uh, became very interesting. People started, instead of just featuring Florida's natural climate and the and the beautiful features we have here, they start bringing in features of other lands, uh, especially Africa and Polynesia and the Western uh, themed parks like Tombstone Territory and Six Gun Territory and making it like a Western town. Monkey Jungle, South Florida, still open by the way. <laughs> so this became kind of fun and Lion Country Safari still open, Monkey Jungle still open, but not the Western towns, they've all folded since the popularity of Western shows kind of diminished. Bear Jungle still open, uh, they moved, but it's still open in Miami area. And you can still go to Goofy Golf in Panama City, the last kind of like putt-putt uh, golf of its kind with big dinosaurs and, and different features. It's a lot of fun to go through it. And this is Six Gun Territory in Ocala. So this was quote, a authentic Western town in Florida, <laughs> they built a mountain, they had a railroad, they had robbers rob the railroad, uh, they had, you know, shootouts in the streets and can-can girls, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, my regret growing up is that I never visited, my dad never took me there, uh, but I would have loved to have gone. I've talked to a lot of people that, that did go and re really enjoy it. This folded um, the 19, early 1980s, and now it's, a lot of it's a shopping center, Six Gun Plaza, and it's a housing development. So there's really nothing left of it. And Web City in uh, St. Petersburg really was the first uh, Walmart type thing where the web combined many different features in one store, not just a drug store. And he, he developed the modern checkout lines as well. So 
he really started kind of the concept of the Walmart type store in Target. And this is uh, not around anymore as well. So travel started changing. So you can see how tourism has evolved in Florida based on travel. You know, started out with the boats and the railroads and then the, the automobile travel. Uh, and, and then the interstates came and that opened up Florida, bypassed some of the old Florida attractions, opened up Disney World and some of the theme parks so that changed. Um, this one photo is of a welcome center in the 1950s and I found the same welcome center abandoned on Highway 19 north of uh, in North Florida. Uh, so, so these small highways have these welcome centers and today they have the Florida Citrus Centers pretty much welcoming people on the interstates. That's really our welcome centers today. A lot of the Springs attractions are really, the major ones are now state parks, they're protected. You can still see uh, the features uh, as part of public property. They're often cheaper now because they are public. And you can still see Lou the Hippo is still alive at Homosassa Springs. It's one of the oldest uh, hippos living in the world today. And uh, they do a feeding and it's very, he's a very popular animal at Homosassa. Homosassa used to be a place where they would house Hollywood animals like Gentle Ben, the bear, and, and lions, and different animals. And so Lou the hippo is the last one left of that era. Wikiwachi is now a state park, and they still do several shows a day. And it's still a beautiful spring. So I encourage you to see Wikiwachi. Uh, when I was a boy, my parents pulled in the parking lot, and we got all excited. We had the brochures. And they kind of looked at these uh, statues of the topless mermaids and they looked probably at the price and they kept on going and pulled back out on Highway 19 and head south. So I missed my chance to see Wikiwachi as a boy. So I saw Wikiwachi as an adult a couple of times. So it's a lot of fun. You can also take a boat tour of the, uh, the river and you can kayak the river as well. Very beautiful Wikiwachi River. And they have one of the last of the Moldomatic machines, which used to be in all of the attractions and it's basically a plastic mold uh, that you put in some money and you pop out a mold. And so my friend and I got one of these, I think cost us $2 each. I saw one on eBay for about $20. So some people are trying to make money on it. The same mold, it's pretty funny. <clears throat> so Rainbow Springs was another fun one. Um, the people in uh, Dunellen area, they changed the name uh, I forgot the original name, but it was, uh, I think it was Jackson Springs or something, but they decided to call it Rainbow Springs. And that conjures up a whole different uh, image in your mind of this beautiful kaleidoscope of colors. And so they develop what they call a submarine boat, which the people are sitting below the water line and seeing the fish and the wildlife below the water line, which is pretty neat. They no longer have these, but they had a gondola ride as well in this upper part here. They still have the waterfalls, they made artificial waterfalls, and they are so old now, they look natural. They look, it's all mossy with ferns and everything, and it looks like a natural waterfall. So it's, it's a very beautiful park to walk around. You can take a swim, you can get a kayak, it's a lot of fun. And De Leon Springs is open now, and they used to have a elephant skiing act with a woman named Liz Dane when she was in high school back in the late 50s. So I called her and interviewed her and she, uh, her family sold the elephant when she went off to college and she lost track of it. But she tracked it down uh, many years later, about 15 years ago in Wild Adventures in Valdosta and the elephant remembered her. They had a big reunion. The elephant has since died, but at least she got to reconnect with the, uh, the original elephant. And in Leon Springs, you can, they have a, restaurant where you make your own pancakes at your table. So it's, they have seven kinds of batter. This was an old grist mill that they would grind the, the flour and, um, and you buy different ingredients for it. And so you pay a pretty good price to make your own food <laughs> at your table, but it's a lot of fun. Silver Springs, as I mentioned, was one of the earliest uh, springs attractions that brought tourists and they, it's still open today, but if you go around the, uh, the back channels, you can see some of the old tour boats that are no longer operational. And this is an old fort they used to have. They used to have a stop on the jungle ride, these different stops. 
And it, this, uh, this drawing in the upper part is from the 1880s. It's been around a long time. They filmed a lot of movies at some of these springs, like The Creature from the Black Lagoon. They also filmed some of that in Wakulla Springs, the back jungle. Silver Springs had one of the few, since there was Jim Crow laws, one of the few attractions where they had a separate attractions for African-Americans called Paradise Park. And so this was a couple miles down from the main spring, but they still had glass bottom boats. They'd still had the reptile shows, the swimming area, but it was segregated. Um, and so you, you can't really see any sign of it today because everything's integrated today, of course. But this was something uh, at the time because most of these attractions did not have separate facilities. So African-Americans really couldn't enter many of these attractions during, uh, before, during Jim Crow laws. The state parks had some separate beaches and things like that. But this is Silver Springs today. You can rent a kayak or bring your own, see the springs or go on a glass bottom boat. It's still very, very beautiful. Wakulla Springs, which is near where I live, south of Tallahassee, uh, started in the 1930s with the big lodge and everything. But before that, it was, it was open as well for, for the small glass bottom boats. And at one time, they had what's called an alligator boat. You go on this, this metal boat, and it's shaped like an alligator. And that's no longer in existence. But they still have the jungle boat rides. And the lodge is still open as well, built in the 1930s. You feel like you're stepping back in time when you visit Wakulla Springs. The rooms don't have televisions, for example. <laughs> so you really have to de unplug when you go there. And I mentioned the alligator. It's been a fascination for generations and still going strong. So you have the alligator attractions around Florida. There's at least six major attractions that feature alligators and many smaller ones. And Gatorland in New Orlando is one of the ones that I enjoyed visiting, but I went to St. Augustine Alligator Farm and some of the other ones, smaller ones as well. Um, and it's a good place to see birds too. They have major uh, rookeries in these, these places because the birds are attracted to uh, large uh, pods of alligators. And so um, the alligators help keep away predators like uh, uh, raccoons and things. You can still see alligator wrestling in the Gatorland and places like that. And they have zip lines like in St. Augustine and Gatorland over the alligators. So it's a lot of fun. <laughs> if, you, if you're into uh, <clears throat> relaxing, go to a place like the Bach Tower Gardens and they a man plays the, the bells, the carillon bells. <coughs> so it's, it's really uh, peaceful, relaxing. This started in 1929 by Edward Bach and was a really popular attraction for a long time. And it still is popular, not quite as popular as, as in the old days. Um, but they have done an expansion now. They have more uh, things for kids to do now. And they the managers took me up into the tower and the, the view is incredible. It's on a place called Iron Mountain, which is the highest point in Peninsula, Florida. So Bach hired the, the top artists of the day to do the tower and the, the artwork. So it's really a work of beauty. The gardens itself was, was they were created by, by uh, Frederick Olmsted Jr., the top landscape architect of the day and a distant relative of my mother's side, who was in Olmstead. And Cypress Gardens is now part of Legoland. So I thought, oh, they still have the Southern Bells at a distance, I saw this bell, but she is made out of Legos. So <laughs> a lot of things are made of Legos, but the, the gardens itself have been restored and they're really pretty. They've maintained the gardens very well. And some of the scenes in the gardens, and even some of the alligators are made of Legos. You can still see wild alligators from the lake, but they have Lego alligators as well. They do not have the boat rides through the canals like in the old days. This is the Florida Pole in the upper um, scene, and this was recreated. This was built originally for an Esther Williams movie, um, and it's still uh, there today. And the banyan tree was was planted by the Popes, the original owners, the late 30s, and this is it today. It's really expanded, covers a huge area. And if there's a freeze, they have different gas vents that they light to help keep the tree from dying. 
And one part of Legoland has scenes around uh, the country and the world. This is the Florida capital and Legos. They have New York City, they have Paris, France, they have a lot of the major cities. So it is pretty fascinating. It's really built for kids with parents, uh, but it is fun to walk through. It's probably the most expensive of the old Florida style attractions because it's considered a theme park today. Most of the other ones are kind of funky and fairly cheap. Marine Land uh, was the first oceanarium that I visited as a kid. And they had the dolphin shows, was a major feature. They did a lot of ground uh, breaking work there with dolphins. Um, they did some military work as well during World War II. Uh, they studied echolocation. That they're the ones that identified echolocation with dolphins while they navigate. They have a nice museum there. But it's really more of a dolphin encounter facility today. A lot of the original structure was destroyed by uh, a couple of hurricanes about 15 or 16 years ago. But you can still see the leaping dolphins and everything uh, as I did when I was a kid. This is really one of the neat funky attractions built in the 80s by a guy named uh, Solomon. Um, and he passed away soon after I interviewed him, but his family still runs the attractions. It's about 30 miles uh, east of Bradenton. You have to look on their website. It's really a, some back roads to get there. But he bought some land that turned out to be swamp land. So he had to build like a moat and build up the land. And he decided to build a castle. So he did. And he used the, for the outside, he used these uh, old printer uh, uh, aluminum. So it's very shiny very bright in the sun. Uh, and he was a, an artist and he built beautiful sculptures and paintings and so forth. This is called the Lion's Club. It's a lion with a club. So he had a lot of puns with his, his statues and creations. The separate ones, the band broke up. So they, they have different, their heads are separated and so forth. But he built the restaurant, we call it the, uh, the Boat and the Moat. It's a Spanish galleon, that's the restaurant. He built several other structures so it's a, it's a funky old Florida attraction that's worth the visit. And classic gardens like Sunken Gardens. Um, this was taken over by the city of St. Petersburg and the people uh, did a, um, uh, they voted on it and they agreed to take it over and to pay a little extra money to buy it uh, about 20 years ago and it's doing very well today. <clears throat> This, this rock in the lower part, it's believed if you sit on this rock, you will be a good gardener, basically. So every new employee has to sit on this rock for a spell. <clears throat> and this is a scene from Sunken Gardens. And of course, I covered different gardens uh, in the book, such as Ravine Gardens near Placa and Washington Oaks Gardens south of St. Augustine, but there's many others around the state. And this one was started by accident. Uh, this guy, Robbie, in the, in the Keys in Isla Mirada, uh, he found an injured tarpon, injured by a gaff hook. So he brought it in to a tank and got a vet to sew it up and kept it in the tank for several months. And when he released it, it kind of hung around the docks. Then it left. Then it started bringing friends. And so pretty soon, many tarpons started hanging around the dock. And they, they, they continue this today. Uh, and so Robbie uh, opened it up the dock, you pay a small fee, you buy a bucket of fish and you can feed the tarp and they will jump out of the water and grab the fish out of your hands. So it's, it's just by accident, this started and it's going strong today. Goofy Golf in Panama City, last of its kind, but just amazing uh, statues and sculptures uh, near Panama City. It's across from the main city uh, beach. And spooky attractions are really uh, popular in Florida. Some towns advertise themselves as the, as the most haunted small town in Florida. Um, and Spook Hill, um, which is uh, near Sebring area, is believed to be, if you, if you roll back, you think you're gonna go forward. I couldn't quite get it, but it's been around for a long time. You can still try this today. You, you go up and then you put it in neutral and coast back and you're, Think you're going to go forward. It's an optical illusion. 
And uh, I covered in the new guide, I added the Citrus Tower and a few other attractions, the Venetian Pool and Coral Gables, and some of the smaller attractions as well. And the, the Citrus Tower was once the one of the highest points in that part of Florida. Uh, and it used to be you get up on the top, you see nothing but citrus trees. And today, uh, mostly you see development. And it, it basically advertises itself now as a uh, celebrates the development of the area. But it is still called a citrus tower. And you can still see some citrus groves from the tower. And see some of the old signs that are still pointing the way to different different uh, things in different directions. You can see about 30 miles or so, depending on the clarity. This is a new uh, addition to the guide. The Boyette Citrus Attraction is one of the funkiest places I've been to. Uh, be inspired by this woman in the upper right. Lots of dinosaurs and black lights, and there's animals, and there's an old west featured uh, area. And it's just kind of a hodgepodge wander through and get lost and it'll take you a couple hours to try to get through the attraction it's it's pretty fun just kind of take it with a you know a dose of fun and it's a lots of old florida attractions lots of uh memorabilia from the old days of florida so if you're around brooksville look it up you can also buy some it started out as just a citrus uh, stand and they have their own citrus grove there as well you can still buy some oranges and, and grapefruit so what's fun about the the uh, the guide, the doing this guide, I got to travel all over the state and visit these places and research some of the classic attractions of Florida and just had a lot of fun with it. Uh, what I enjoyed most is getting the feedback of people that uh, claim that they, they did vacations using my guide as a guide. So that's a lot of fun to get that feedback and they would tell me some of their favorite attractions. And so it's always good to have the stories. Uh, from different folks that, that have used the guide. So I want to show you just a couple things. I'll get to your questions. Of course, souvenirs are hand in hand in Florida. So this is a jug you could buy at Silver Springs, Silver Springs Swamp Water. Just things like this would be sold in gift shops. You know, in a long time ago, paperweights were really popular. This is one from um, Monkey Jungle, can't see that too well. And this is Silver Springs, <laughs> hard to see these. Um, and I don't think anybody really sells paperweights anymore. And this is one of the old, uh, about every big hotel would have paperweights as well that they would sell. This is down in Miami, this motel was down in Miami, hotel. And you had things before digital clocks, you had calendars that you would buy, souvenir calendars. And this is one that you would put in the, the date and be on your desk and it would show you what day it is. A lot of fun. <clears throat> of course, the old days, ashtrays were more popular. Smoking was more widespread. And so every gift shop had ashtrays. This is a souvenir ashtray, pre interstate. I like to collect things like like tablecloths and scarves and ashtrays that show the state of Florida before the interstates and before Disney, because that's really the old Florida one. You always had alligators, the flamingos, usually some common themes in these souvenirs. And of course, smoking was big, so you had lighters. This is a souvenir lighter, probably from the 50s, with uh, usually the state of Florida on it. So a pretty classic, still works. Of course, I don't use it, I don't smoke, but then you had little gift boxes. This is from the Everglades with an alligator on it, of course. Um, and things like salt and pepper shakers were very common. Um, souvenir items, this one has this flamingo. So flamingos, one of the icons for Florida souvenirs, alligators, flamingos palm trees. And so I have some Tallahassee uh, items and they, they have palm trees on them. There's a few palm trees around Tallahassee, cabbage palms, but it's really not known for palm trees or beaches, Tallahassee, but it's on the uh, pennant. And, uh, and every town had its own 
felt pennant like this in the 50s. What's funny about this one, Key West really does not have alligators. <laughs> it's really sticking out there in the salt water. Occasionally now they do have some saltwater crocodiles that make their way down there. But there's no alligators in Key West that I know of. So let me open up the chat line, or if you want to just uh, orally ask me a question, that's fine. But I'll open it up for some questions if you have any. I think I see any right now. Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions either. We can give it a bit more. If anybody has any questions, feel free. Oh, you got one. What's my favorite place? I I kind of have two across between Wikiwachi and the Bach Tower. So it depends on if I want funky old Florida, it's Wikiwachi. Be something like that where you can see mermaid shows and you see a lot of the old Florida um, statues and so forth. But if I want kind of a classic uh, garden type um, attraction, the Bach Tower Gardens is, is really neat uh, near Lake Wales. So uh, both of those were my favorites. But I like a lot of them. The Boyettes was fun because it was a hodgepodge of everything and it's really funky. Uh, they really need to give you a map when you go through there because you can get lost. <laughs> it's a fun kids show yes it's good for kids too and wiki watchy a lot of the, the shows are geared towards kids so i wish i was able to go there when i was a kid a lot of times people go to these places um they want to just kind of have a simpler type of traction that's not going to um uh eat up their wallet too bad and um and spend you know two or four hours you don't always spend days there like some of the uh, theme parks, but you can hit two or three attractions in a day if they're close together and uh, have a good time and not spend too much money. So it's not a question, but we did get a comment on Facebook. Um, it's nice that there are still old Florida attractions that are still open. Exactly. That's what's fascinating when I started the book was how many are left that are still open. Now, many of these were taken over by uh, either the state, the county governments, or a city uh, and kept them open that way. But some are like the alligator attractions are all private and doing really quite well. And so I think some people, there's a certain part of the population that really enjoys going to these things. I went to Gatorland last summer, uh, before the, the summer before the pandemic, in July hot afternoon and yet it was packed with people. So it's very popular uh, and doing really good. Definitely. Another comment, I recently drank out of the Fountain of Youth. Unfortunately, it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's funny about the Fountain of Youth depends on which Fountain of Youth because they, St. Augustine has a Fountain of Youth attraction, but St. Petersburg had claimed it had the Fountain of Youth. And there was a couple other spots that claimed to have the original Fountain of Youth. So um, no one really knows exactly where. Uh, well, the Fountain of Youth was created after Ponce de Leon died by a writer. So really there, there was no Fountain of Youth. But there, there was a belief among some of the Native Americans I heard that there were some healing springs uh, in West Florida area, probably around Tampa Bay area and so forth. And so there was some draw among some of the Native Americans. So maybe that's where it got started. Uh, so I think it may have got started because some of the springs had some medicinal qualities, these sulfur springs, like with rheumatism, people just felt better when they took a bath in them. But it didn't work for me either. I tried it. <laughs> I'm, getting older. I'm getting more gray every year. But it's fun. St. Augustine has a fun fountain of youth attraction. They combine all kinds of things with it now. St. Augustine is a fun place to visit as a tourist. There's all kinds of attractions there. And 
they have some nice streets like St. George Street where there's no vehicles and so you can just walk these streets um, downtown without any vehicle traffic. So, and you can take, still take these, uh, these trolleys, you know, basically you're in a car and being pulled by a, a vehicle and you take like a trolley ride around town and that's fun. Do that in Key West as well. Say one person, I did find a fun ghost tour in Key West. Yes. So there's ghost tours all over the state now, and this wasn't always the case. St. Augustine may have started it because they still have ghost tours, and that, that was around when I was a kid too, the ghost tours. But now you can find them all over the state, including places like the Haunted Bridge in remote Jackson County that have signs and they claim it's haunted, this, this abandoned bridge. Uh, things like that. They feature these now as tourist uh, attractions. Monticello, Florida is the one that styles, styles itself as the most haunted small town in America. A long time ago, you probably wouldn't want to advertise that, but now they would attract people, not repel people. <laughs> oh, how times have changed. <laughs> times have changed, yes. Learned about the Corpse Bride in Key West, yes. And they develop these stories around the, the tours. So you can learn about the history of the area and these ghost tours. So it's a neat way to, to really share history uh, because you have to tell these stories of different uh, ghosts that are seen around these places. So I don't see any other questions or comments. Um, I think, thank you, Doug, once again, for doing this. We really appreciate it. All of your thank programs you. that you do are awesome and you offer such a great perspective on Florida. As you can tell, I enjoyed it. It's, it's been a kind of a fun hobby for me for a long time to do these books and before that magazine article. So I'll just continue doing them as long as I can because it's, it's just, uh, I enjoy the, the research, the travel, and then um, the writing and Lately, the last few years, collecting the photographs, the old photographs for the different books, too. So mm -hmm. I have a pretty good collection of old postcards and photos from uh, the last 130 years or so. Awesome. And when does your second book come out? The second it book is out. It already came out? Yeah, it's, that, out. yeah it's already out. Awesome. And I, I received my sample copies the other day, so, and somebody said they saw it in a Books of Million in Central Florida, so I, I know it's out. Awesome. And, um, I think it's distribution gets a little slow during the pandemic. Some of the presses kind of half shut down and people go on furlough. So things have slowed down in that area a little bit, even though people are reading more. So it's, um, you know, there's definitely interest in more books uh, and reading today. So I encourage you to check out the book. Um, and if the library doesn't have it, I'm sure they, they will get it soon. Yes, I believe we ordered it. So we should have it for people. You might out. have the first edition around too, and there's most of that information is still uh, relevant. Awesome. Well, All right. um, I think that's it. Thank you, Doug. And as I said, this is going to be on our social media and YouTube for people to watch after the fact if they'd like to. And yeah, I hope everyone has a great day and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Madison. And thank you very much, everybody. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.